Peace and love and welcome to the Los Angeles Sentinel Daily Brief. This is where we talk black and talk back to the headlines that are important to the black experience. I'm Neil Anderson and here's what you need to know for today. Nine years ago, on this very day, the hashtag Black Lives Matter became a global movement with a mission to challenge racism, discrimination, inequality, and to reimagine the U.S. police system. Joining me now is one of the co-founders and the director of Black Lives Matter Grassroots, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Welcome to the day. Three. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So honored to have you here. Um, let's start with nine years ago on this very day. Tell us what happened. Yeah, nine years ago, July 13th, 2013, was the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get justice. And the world erupted, Los Angeles erupted in particular, and thousands of us poured out into the streets to say that we're not going to let the theft of Trayvon Martin's life go unanswered. And so for three days, we engaged in what we call intuitive protest. I received a text asking us to meet. It said, uh, the text read, meet at 9 p.m. at St. Elmo Village. And mm. it felt like this message from the contemporary Underground Railroad. And we talked about the importance of building a movement, not a moment. Mm -hmm. And what we were recognizing is that until we transform these systems under which we live, there will always be another name. And so right. we have to build a movement that endures and now we've endured nine years and we'll continue to struggle until these systems are toppled and new ones are built. Many within our community question, why doesn't Black Lives Matter deal with black on black crime as they do with um, black individuals being victimized by police officers? In Black Lives Matter, we are very clear that systems of harm have to be toppled mm -hmm. and new systems of care have to be built. We also recognize we're not the only space in movement. And right. so we work in community with organizations like the Reference Project, right? With organizations like Second Call, mm -hmm. who have been doing work to address community violence for decades and working with people like Akila Sherrills and Skip Townsend mm -hmm. and so many others. Mm -hmm. So when we say things like defund the police and reimagine public safety, what we're doing is saying, take dollars out of the policing and prison and jail systems that are harmful and use those dollars to invest them in community solutions right. like we see with Second Call. Why do you think that uh, Democrats have such a hard time in articulating the defund the police concept? Because all it means is to reimagine and reallocate funds, not take away, but just look at how you're spending your budget. And maybe you should put those in mental wellness programs. Maybe you should put those in the homeless programs instead of police departments. Police associations have bullied and bribed elected officials, including folks in the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party, so that they can continue to gobble up more than 50 percent of our taxpayer dollars, right? They want to make sure that policing grows even when it's ineffective, right. even when it's harmful. Every time we show the public what the budget is and ask, what do you want to spend your dollars on? Mm -hmm. The public says we are concerned about right. public safety and we know that public safety comes when you invest in housing, when you invest in good jobs, when you invest in after school programs, right. not overspending on police. This uh, country has a history of trying to always tear down powerful black movements from the civil rights to the Black Panthers. Um, recently, Black Lives Matter, they've been in the news, the Associated Press um, reported that in 2020, that Black Lives Matter Foundation uh, raised around $90 million. And the allocation of those funds and the paperwork that was obtained did not match up in some ways. Can you speak to that and um, its impact on the um, Black Lives Matter movement? Sure. So it's really important to remember that in 2020, 
Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, of which I'm not a part, right? right? And I've never been a part, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Global Network Foundation is actually a new entity that is mm -hmm. not really grounded in the on the work movement. Okay. The Global Network Foundation received $90 million. So they didn't go out and fundraise the $90 million. It was people wanting to know what they could do mm -hmm. to um, amplify and demand justice in the name of George Floyd, in the name of Breonna Taylor. It doesn't seem to me mm -hmm. that there was any misappropriation and definitely no illegalities right. in terms of their use of funds. What they did in 2020 is try and find their footing as a relatively new organization that wasn't really prepared to right, receive. Right. Not, nobody was prepared. And that's what movement is. That's you what can't movement is. Determine. It's like um, it's evolving as you grow. Mm -hmm. Goals of the foundations are to grow the dollars, right. so that you can continue the work and live off of the interest. They usually set aside about five to ten percent um, of what they have to grant out rather than spending it all, right? We don't want to spend it all. We want to make sure we have a movement that's right. enduring. Can you tell us and um, help our family understand the difference between Black Lives Matter Foundation, Global Foundation, and Black Lives Matter Grassroots? Black Lives Matter, in 2013, we were birthed as a movement, mm -hmm. right? And so we really didn't have a legal formation. Okay. In 2020, where we saw this explosion of both movement, this influx of resources. Mm -hmm. It was the first time we ever had major resources, right? right? There was a question. And so Patrice Cullors, who's one of our co-founders and a dear friend, she chartered the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation to be an independent, autonomous entity okay. that would receive money and grant out money. The sister organization was the work that I do, Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which is the boots on the ground. It's the protests that you see. You know, every time you see 200,000 folks in the streets or a uh, hundred folks in the right. streets, right? Mm -hmm. Or the work that we do in community to build black businesses, um, the work that we do in the schools, that's Black Lives Matter grassroots. Okay. That's the movement work. Within these past nine years, can you talk to us a little bit about the progress that you've seen based upon movement work? We've seen tremendous progress. I want people to think back to 2013. We didn't even get to say black, right? Every time we said we're fighting for black people, we had to, you know, kind of cloak ourselves mm -hmm. under this like um, veil of people of color, right? Mm -hmm. We had to say black and brown, just the ability to be unapologetically black. We didn't even have that term until now, mm -hmm. right? Till the Black Lives Matter era. When we think about defunding the police and this idea that cities shouldn't be gobbling up half of the city's resources um, or spending half of the city's resources on police, right. that's a new thought. When we say police don't have the right to kill us and it can't go unanswered, mm -hmm. right? That came from the work of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, when we think about things like Valde, right, mm -hmm. we're reminded over and over that police don't keep our babies safe either. Right, you know, right. that when you empower teachers, you know, it's those teachers mm -hmm. who gave their lives for those babies. So yes, we've seen tremendous victory. We're gonna win some more. Mm -hmm. We got policy work on the table. We just won the Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Bill in California. We're going after uh, qualified immunity that mm -hmm. shields police when they kill our people. They don't even have to be accountable. And right. so this is the work of Black Lives Matter moving forward as well as remaining boots on the ground. Tell us something about Black Lives Matter and the work that Black Lives Matter is doing that people might not know about. I don't think people know that Black Lives Matter works in schools with young people. Mm -hmm. I don't think that most people know that we partner with organizations like Students Deserve and right now have about 30 kids down the street in uh, Africa town and mm -hmm. are doing an internship program with them so they can develop their organizational skills. I don't think most people know about our Black Xmas um, annual campaign where mm -hmm. we say buy black by spending exclusively with black owned businesses right. and bank black by moving your money and, okay. you know, put your money in places like One United Banks. I don't think most people know about black women are divine that we uplift 
Black women in the name of Breonna Taylor, recognizing the divinity and power of Black women. I don't think most people know that when you come to a Black Lives Matter meeting, we make sure we feed you a hot meal and send you home with you know, vegan, organic food for you to cook for at least a couple of weeks. We are an abolitionist organization in the truest sense. And when we think about Mama Harriet Tubman, mm. who helped to topple chattel slavery, but also established a home for the elderly and infirmed where she loved up on Black people who were taking their own freedom and found freedom after emancipation. That's also what we're trying to do is build the kind of world that we want to live in in the spaces that we can control. You are a doctor and a professor of Pan-African Studies. What will be the impact of critical race theory in our education system? Why do you think Republicans are pushing critical race theory number one? And what will the impact be if they are successful? So I'm going to sound real non-professor for a minute. They're a bunch of idiots. Okay. We don't teach critical race theory in K through 12. Critical race theory is actually a legal theory that was birthed by people like Derrick Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw. It's something that is taught mostly in law schools. What I advocate for in K through 12 is ethnic studies that mm -hmm. teaches the truth about who we are as people of color, teaches the truth about what this country and what this world is, that um, makes sure that we think about multiple ways, many ways of knowing. So we encourage our young people to come into the classroom and know that, yeah, you're gonna read some books, but also what your grandmother taught you, mm -hmm. that's knowledge too. And that the knowledge that's produced has an impact in the communities. That's what the right wing is afraid of. Right. They don't want our young people, especially not black young people, to be empowered um, as change agents. Black Lives Matter also pushed a bill in the state of California making ethnic studies a requirement in the Cal State system. We're also supporting a bill to make it a requirement in the K through 12 system. And final question for you, uh, Black Lives Matter has built political power and you flexed a little of your political power uh, in the primaries for the Los Angeles mayor's race. So Mr. Bakewell made sure that I asked you this question. You didn't endorse Karen Bass. You endorsed another candidate who was no longer in the running. And so now the race is between Karen Bass, Rick Caruso. Will you be endorsing Karen Bass in the general election? I don't know if I'm going to endorse in the general election. I will say I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to make sure that Rick Caruso does not win. We can't forget that he called um, our auntie Maxine mm -hmm. out of her name. We can't forget what he did um, as a member of the Los Angeles Police Commission. We can't forget what his track record has been in supporting right-wing agendas. We can't forget what it means that he is a um, predatory capitalist. And so we have to do everything that we can to make sure Rick Caruso is never Mayor Caruso. How can people keep up with Black Lives Matter grassroots? So we love if everybody would follow Black Lives Matter Grassroots at BLM Grassroots on all social media. Um, and then be with us in these streets. We chant down the LA Police Protective League every single Wednesday at 4 p.m. at 1313 West 8th Street. Um, and we constantly do work to make sure that we build. We're um, also headed, I'm on my way to Akron, um, to make sure that we build in the name of Jalen Walker. There's mm. still work to be done in Buffalo, where 10 of our loved ones were slaughtered inside that grocery store. That grocery store plans to reopen on mm. Friday. Think about what it means that Black people are going to mm. have to grocery shop on a floor that has been stained by the blood of our Black elders. What does that mean? And so we want to make sure that everyone is plugging in. The more people we have plugged in, the more change that we can create. So please follow BLM Grassroots on all social media and do what you can to support this work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Nia. family, as we reflect on nine years of the Black Lives Matter movement, we encourage you to reflect on how you could further the liberation of Black folks in America. I'm Neil Anderson, and you have just been debriefed. <laughs>